everyone and thank you for joining today's KNU online conference titled The New Normal Meeting the Challenge of a New Educational Future. We could never have imagined that such dramatic changes would take place affecting the way we live and work, restricting our international travel and of course impacting our world of university education. Therefore we need strategic leadership that can take us forward so I am delighted to introduce our KNU president, Dr. Sung Dong Kim, who indeed initiated today's conference and who will share his welcome message and hopes for this special event. Welcome colleagues, friends and educators. It is my honor to open this conference by extending my deepest gratitude for your contributions and participation in this event. Like many around the world, we face continuing challenges as we adjust to significant changes in our daily lives, many that impact the very social foundations of our society. Yet, I am often inspired by the innovation and the determination of people in our communities like you, who refuse to be set back by these changes and instead find a way to move us successfully into the future. For us, professionally, that means providing the highest quality education possible in a time when most of everything we have depended on for doing so has been taken away. However, as proven time and time again, we have all taken this opportunity to rethink our approach and find valuable solutions to immediate problems. But it must continue. The horizon is full of new challenges that demand original ideas and creative exploration. Our institutions hold for our students while ensuring they receive the most beneficial experience we can deliver. Recently, Gyeongbuk National University won the placement in the top 100 of the higher education impact ranking. We are proud of our achievement and standing in this prestigious community. And because so, we have further cemented our commitment to building and growing partnerships with people like you. People who are devoted to the core values of our universities and institutes. For this conference, we are coming together in the interest of going beyond what we have already accomplished. We need to think in new directions and build upon our already outstanding collaborations. We must pledge that we take care to listen to new ideas and challenge each other to build avenues of opportunities for our students they more than meet expectations. They must send your standards. Enjoy this conference and don't hesitate to ask questions and offer your input. We must raise the best in all of us in order to better prepare for the road ahead. This is a time of great change. 
and I am confident that together, starting right now, we will redefine the new normal. Thank you. Thank you, President Kim. Well, we have quite a tall order to accomplish today. Now, this online conference has been specially designed as a forum to engage our international partners and explore new collaborative strategies. We all learn by asking questions and we are among friends. So don't hesitate to send us your comments and questions with or without your name and institution. Then we can make this a really interactive and learning opportunity. We've scheduled 10 minutes for Q&A after each presentation, so make sure to be an active audience. Now, let's start by introducing our first speaker, Dr. Paul Doyle. Paul is a senior lecturer in the School of Computer Science at TU Dublin, formerly DIT. Located in the exciting city of Dublin and surrounded by amazing scenery, KNU and TU Dublin have had an active partnership since 2014, including three EU-funded projects. One of these projects, Global Work IT, included a special online global classroom, which reflects Paul's passion to use technology to pursue new ways of effective teaching and learning. Paul knows very well, having participated KNU very well, having participated in our KNU summer school two times. Plus, he has enjoyed various experiences with Korean history and Korean food culture. It's my very great pleasure to welcome Dr. Paul Doyle to share his insights on maintaining and expanding partnerships under the new normal for global education. Paul, hello and welcome. Hello everyone, um, very nice to be here. So thanks very much Lauren for that introduction. Uh, I'll just uh, share my presentation. Um, yeah, so 20 minutes, it's not very long to actually go through this. So what I'll do is just maybe set up a little bit of um, the thinking behind what we do in terms of when we start uh, these partnerships. So we've been working with uh, KNU for quite a long time and it's really from that interaction that um, I certainly looked at how to teach and, and how to work with uh, partners uh, abroad. So this presentation really just looks at three of the, the ways we're currently doing that and um, some of the motivations behind that. The very first thing we try and encourage people to do is to first of all not throw away everything that they've already been doing. So um, when it actually comes to building any new courses, um, we kind of have to go back a little bit and reflect in, on teaching in general. So there's lots of theory around this and um, I'm sure you've been involved in trying to figure out how people learn, how they um, engage in technology. And a lot of what we do, we do because it works. And we have models of repeating things. We can um, link new ideas to existing ones and we build uh, new understandings for people. So when we're actually teaching, uh, what we're really aiming to do is to figure out how to enthuse the students. And that really requires understanding the students. And when you're dealing with a partner or when you're dealing with um, someone who isn't even necessarily in your culture, then you need to figure out how to understand those students and what motivates them. So it's quite interesting that in my experience working in, in Korea in China and some of our other partners, that the cultural dimension of what we do is actually uh, hugely important. So what we think works um, in general, in a normal classroom, may not work um, when we go abroad. Um, and what we think works from a technology point of view uh, also needs to be scrutinized and understood in the context of the partner. Um, so usually when we actually engage in teaching, there's a, a factual component to this. So we're trying to cover a syllabus, we have things we specifically have to get through. We're trying to teach in large groups because one-to-one -one is obviously expensive and we're trying to impart uh, general information. But to be honest, the engagement side of that is a huge aspect of what we do. 
So again, from a traditional point of view, and we need to understand that we've been teaching a particular way for like thousands of years, where we've been repeating and using conversation and interaction to try and understand how people um, learn. So we tend to focus on collaboration. Um, we try and figure out the motivation um, of our students and we certainly have a lot of this interaction going forward. So one of the main criticisms, if you like, of an online forum and even doing a presentation like this um, is just trying to figure out how to get that interaction going. So how do we present enough material and then stimulate the audience to engage in that uh, and then to reflect. Now, when we look at the online learning capabilities that we currently have, and this is very much a 20 year kind of engagement in technology for, from a teaching point of view, we, we have this idea of being able to teach global. And, I, and this is a huge advantage in my opinion. So the idea that we could engage with students in different countries and not even necessarily being there um, is, is amazingly important. And technology provides us um, with this. So the flexibility in, when we do online learning um, means that we need to be creative. And one of the aspects that I like of um, the online learning is effectively ripping up the way we currently teach and ripping it up in terms of asking ourselves, why do we do certain things? Because we can quite easily fall into a pattern of a two hour lecture, three hour lecture, um, we go through the material, maybe enthusiastically or maybe not so enthusiastically, but we know we've presented the material. And we know people have been there engaging with it. But when it comes to online learning, um, we have to think about um, different ways to do that. So really blended learning is just a way of getting the technology into our teaching and using it to its, its best ability. Right? So um, not all technology works, not all technology is appropriate. Um, depending on the subject and depending on the audience, we can spend quite a lot of time, um, you know, missing the point by just using technology for its own sake. And if you've heard terms like blended learning, hybrid learning, flexible learning, integrated learning, the reality is it's just effectively bringing technology into what we do. And there's lots of different definitions. Um, one of the things that I have been working on, and I'll share a link um, after the talk, is we've been working on an e-handbook, which is in English, Slovenian, German, and, and Greek, and Spanish, um, which is really just to help people figure out how to blend components of their teaching. So I'll share that as just a free um, European um, e-resource that we've, uh, we've developed. And it just tries to bring you through all of, the, um, all of the different things you can do and how technology may be used. But when we come to building courses, especially if we're trying to build them for a partner who's remote, um, we want to have a student-centered blended learning uh, model. And by that, I mean that we understand who we're trying to teach. So it is a teacher-led instruction. It's not just online where you can go at your own pace and, and pick up things um, and engage or not engage. So we do want to have uh, a structured uh, series of um, material which we uh, reveal with the students and we bring them through assessments to make sure they're engaging. There's a terrible habit with this kind of technology for people to see uh, a huge amount of uh, material and, and then back off or worse still think that they can just catch up at the very last week because um, all the material is online, which of course we know isn't true because it takes a long time to absorb this kind of um, material. Now, some of the benefits of um, providing flexible material, uh, even in our remote teaching, is the ability to um, allow the students to engage and repeat that engagement uh, on a regular basis. So it's quite often if you give a problem to a student that they may need to go over it three or four times. So if you've produced material where this is um, shown very clearly, um, then students can work through that solution uh, many times without re-engaging necessarily with the lecture. So we've been involved in this uh, for quite, as a, quite a few years. And the motivation is actually because we have partners in Asia. And the number one problem that we all have is that even before COVID-19 is that travel is difficult. Um, going to a partner and staying there for three months um, isn't always feasible. Some of our more experienced lecturers have families or they have ties and commitments in their home country. 
So we've embraced blended learning and, and developed multiple models specifically to address this problem. So this just happens to be extremely useful at the moment because um, even when we want to travel at the moment, potentially that won't be possible for, for some time to come. Now, one of the questions people ask is, uh, what's the breakdown? How do you decide how much face-to-face -face or uh, how much online are you going to um, work with? And the reality is it, it, it depends. It depends on the classroom, it depends on the subject, it depends on the support from the partner. So don't necessarily think that what I'm doing is advocating a model of fully online, like um, Udemy course or some of these other uh, educational systems. Um, what I am proposing and what we do is engage with the partner. This isn't about putting up a website and not having engagement. This is about working with the partner, in my opinion, to try and get them to contribute and collaborate on development and delivery of material. So the distance learning uh, that we've been doing um, has been very much uh, computer science focused, but we've tried to branch out from that. We've tried to look at uh, teaching language such as Korean and building courses for that, and really focusing on things other than just core computer science. So we definitely believe what we do um, is applicable to lots of different uh, scenarios. And what I want to do is actually just go through briefly three of those scenarios so you can see the practical aspects of what we're doing. Now, Lauren mentioned we have a thing called the Global Classroom. Um, this came out of one of the European projects uh, and Korean projects that we collaborated with on uh, Global Work IT. And what this was, was the, um, the focus of bringing a team together, which was made up of students in different international locations. And that meant that we had to overcome quite a few different problems. We had Korean students in Germany and Finland, Irish students in Germany and uh, Korea. And really this mix um, set us with a challenge of trying to run a classroom with a nine hour difference um, in each location. And by doing that, we're just asking the students to build projects, something that they would have been um, able to do as part of their course anyway, but to do it in a, a distributed way and trying to figure out the cultural issues um, around that. And it was led from TU Dublin primarily, but with mentors from each of the other countries, which meant we had to collaborate as lecturers. So one again of the, of the features I, I just want to emphasize is that when you build courses, the collaboration with the partner is what makes it work and not just doing something on your own and then presenting it uh, to the partner. The teaching and learning model that we worked with, um, we had regular synchronous classes. So when we talk about live classes, we, we really do believe that there's a, a part to play of uh, a Zoom type uh, interaction regardless of the technology. And the thing is to make sure that that is extremely focused. It's not extremely long, but has a, a function and a purpose. And the purpose is not for the students to be quiet, but to be interactive in that environment. So we had uh, synchronous and asynchronous. So asynchronous meant that we built um, video material and other material, which we allowed the students to consume during the week. Um, TU Dublin awarded the credits to the students and we had continuous assessment, which meant engagement was a massive part of the, the course. Um, students had to produce weekly material and demonstrate their uh, involvement and their activity. And there was an aspect of peer review uh, by the students themselves, which contributed to some of their grades. So to do this, what we had um, were video lectures. We had guest lectures, people from Korea, people from Germany, people from China, uh, contributing to course material and genuinely making an international feel to it. Um, this made us consider our language. This made us consider how we were discussing things. And this made us understand more of the cultural aspects that we had to deal with. Um, of course, the usual slides, templates, uh, papers, these are always part of our courses and these were available to the students. And we also did live streaming and recording and then playback for students. What we felt worked particularly well in this model was that we maintained regular touch points with our students. So this was a course where we knew all of the partners involved. And this was a five partner project. Uh, we could always contact our students. So we looked for a new benefit in the course, which wasn't there before which is when we send our students to another location, um, we have um, 
a genuine touch point, which isn't a how are you doing, it's more an engagement and what are you doing. And the benefits of this were, of course, that we could watch the teams genuinely interact uh, from a cultural point of view, but we could also just figure out how they were getting on, how they were performing, how the placement was actually um, progressing. So used to using a course which appears to be technology focused, but was really more about teamwork and professionalism and culture. Um, and, and they were really the learning outcomes we we're going for in this one. We, we also provided real world scenarios. I think one of the benefits of doing any of these kind of courses is that we can look at um, ways to make it practical for students. Um, as academics, tend, we tend sometimes to focus on the traditional examples of things, but the traditional examples of things in different countries is not always the same. So real world examples and scenarios um, became the focus of that particular project. There were quite a few challenges. Um, so we have communications um, technology. It has definitely been improving um, over the last couple of years, but we had cultural and and language issues as well. So operating outside your native language um, can be very frustrating for students. Cultural issues of um, who should do how much work, how to lead projects, how to take orders from someone from a different nationality um, in terms of a team structure were all aspects and, and difficult things uh, to work through, uh, but we did it very successfully. Um, and simple things like timetabling. So working with partners on their timetables and their timelines uh, was very important. So that was just one. Um, we had a second one where we're working with mobile application development uh, through English. It's a technical course in China. And for this one, we had um, the material again developed in Ireland, but we had a 30 classroom single location in, in Beijing. And this worked, again, I will put down primarily to the interaction with the partner on the ground. So they provided a very engaging, very motivated um, Chinese lecturer. And while we produced the material and we produced it in English, they ran the course in terms of labs in English in, in China. And we also had an interaction on a regular basis to do this. So again, these weekly synchronized uh, checkpoints were important. So we would come online at ridiculous times for us or for the students, both being quite flexible. We provided offline material. We did weekly, again, touchpoint labs run by our partners in China, but through English. And they awarded the credits. So we went through their accreditation system, whereas in the previous one, the credits were from TU Dublin. So we could work with both models. And we have a continuous assessment project um, at the end. We built very similar things in this one, but we built maybe uh, slightly more. And one of the features we added in this particular mode were uh, subtitles and transcripts. So all the material was true English. And in this case, the English language capability of the students was good, but they weren't confident. So we produced English subtitles, not translated subtitles. And we had a group form, again, run through English, supported by our Chinese partner. Um, and we had final face-to-face -face presentations where the students would present in English and discuss their project and interact with us. And everything up to that point was really leading to us um, preparing them and, and upping their confidence. Partner relations, uh, I'll just emphasize, again, the most important part. You do not build a course for a partner without their support. You do not build a successful course uh, without their involvement. And I think that's one thing I would certainly emphasize. The communication technology, still a problem. Um, in this particular case, we're going through the Great uh, Wall of China. So um, just transferring things and language comprehension. But again, uh, it worked extremely well in terms of our ability to um, produce course year after year. In fact, we've built a number of courses with them and we've been delivering that for uh, four years now. And the partnership has worked because we have traveled initially to China and they came to Ireland when this was just this meet and greet. But I think you all have an advantage with KNU and the grounds that we know each other already. We have contacts and we can use that basis uh, to build new courses.
At the moment, we're building a third one. And this is, again, a slight change. This is global labs, but for non-computer science. Um, this one is uh, a new VLE we're just going to launch um, for uh, students. So we're going to provide a free version in this particular case, but at the same time provide a paid for version, which will be registered for students and offer that to our partners, including KNU. Um, but this one takes our material and breaks it down even more, uses more technology in terms of each of the little steps that we, we go through. So it takes a huge amount of work, I'll be totally honest, to do this, but the preparation is that we have a two month window to produce material, which will start in late September. And using that um, material and our experience that we believe we can provide a, a, an engaging environment for students, um, which as I said, will be run in two different approaches. So one, for example, we will provide always a support uh, forum uh, which would be monitored and allow students to interact and give them uh, rewards for interacting. Um, and the second thing is to, to provide an actual teaching assistant uh, online where you can basically, you know, knock on the door and they will answer and they can have a one-to-one -one conversation. And as well as having classrooms which are purely focused, not on teaching new material, but actually reviewing the work and the assignments and the problems that we've set for the students. So the online component is only focused on going through specific problems for students based on what we've given them. So we want them to engage because they don't understand something and they have something to learn, not listening to us just talking about slides and, and theory and new, on, uh, new concepts because we can do that um, online. And a lot of assessment and coding um, as part of that, but that assessment, as I said, can be in any form. In terms of our experience, um, the engagement is the, the hard thing and the thing you have to focus on. And I think if you believe you can bring a traditional classroom to an online forum and speak for two hours, then you're fooling yourself, fooling the students. And um, once you can monitor attendance, you'll find it drops off very quickly. So you have to break your material down. You have to um, have very strong focus on, on continuous assessment and uh, small bites of work for students to do. So they can consume a hundred small pieces, whereas three very large pieces might actually um, stop students engaging and have a barrier to re-engaging if for any reason they disengage. And we focus on things like attendance, um, certainly monitoring it and giving students something to do on a regular basis. So when it comes to blended learning, the characteristics that we um, want to emphasize is that no matter what you're doing, um, it's still about content. You, you can't produce a high quality course and, and fail to look at good quality content. Um, so the lectures or the people you put building these courses need to be fully aware and fully understand that their quality of the content and how it's broken down um, is hugely important. We can certainly reach more people, but the idea is that we need to engage those people and maintain that engagement uh, through the courses. And the assessment is critical. Um, you need to know how students are performing. They need to understand there is assessment as, as we move through it. And as ever, focus on quality, the quality of the video and the quality of the audio or the quality of the problem or the quality of the answer and the solution you give is always extremely important. And only working with partners can we get that extra dimension from the partners to explain what the students expect or how they usually engage and how we should change our approach. Um, this does not cost as much money as people uh, fear. Um, we have you know, consumer grade technology to produce high quality video and material. Again, focus on content. And it's really about building a better learning experience. So the feedback we go through um, with students um, is really important. Every one of these sessions have a review at the end to see how can we be better? What can we do differently? And really, if you're working with your partners and you're working with KNU and you're build, building these courses in collaboration, you need to have a partner, and you need to have someone that you can talk to who will be 100% honest and tell you what works and tell you what doesn't work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Great. So we have actually a few questions here. So let me just start right away. Um, first one, 
Have you noticed a cultural difference between the engagement of Asian students and European students to online courses? And is this relevant? Um, yeah, I, I think there are differences at, at various times. Um, I think just anecdotally looking at uh, COVID-19 responses from different countries. In Ireland, for example, students have been delighted to go online. They think this is a fantastic opportunity um, not to travel. Um, but Korea takes education extremely seriously. And I, and I think a lot of the students demanded higher quality in terms of their online material. So I, I think um, this is just the beginning though. So I think all students after maybe a six month period of, of trying some online material will demand higher engagement, will demand higher quality. So I think it starts off with some differences, but it will converge. Everyone wants good quality education and the content they're provided and how it's provided after the grace period, um, I think will we'll come down to, we all have to do the same thing. It has to be high quality. Good. Next one. Um, how do you experience teaching satisfaction via an online format? Isn't something lost? Um, it's not the same. Uh, and, I, and I think to try and defend and say, it's exactly like teaching in the classroom. It, it's not the same as teaching in the classroom. There are aspects of engagement um, which you're going to lose. Um, so this is why you have to change your material. This is why you have to engage in the likes of tutorials. We sometimes think that that feedback that we get from students when we're teaching is a good reflection on how the students are, are doing, but it's usually a few students asking questions and, and trying to engage with us. Um, a lot of times um, the questions are based on the fact that people you know, like talking and then they like just having a reaffirmed answer. But when it comes to online, um, we, can't we can't replicate that in terms of just lecturing. So the whole idea of me talking for 20 minutes um, with no feedback um, isn't the same. But what can be different and can be better is we can actually monitor students better. We should be able to create systems where we can, you know, see which students are actually engaging, which students are being active, not which students are just turning up, how students are performing. We can use this technology to focus on the students who actually need our help. We can use technology to figure out which students are disengaging. So it's not the same, but it can potentially give us a, an advantage we haven't had, which is not just focusing on the students in front of us, but focusing on the students who are not there and using technology to help us. We want everybody to succeed, uh, not just the people who ask questions because they're not necessarily all the ones uh, who are going to fail. Okay. Uh, we have a question here from Stephanie Drug from bonn rhein sieg University in Germany. She's saying, in the first format, I think that's scenario one, how did you form teams? Did you have local teams or did you go for intercultural teams? If the latter, how did you overcome the cultural differences? You mentioned that you tackled that successfully. Sure. Um, well, we had um, typically 30 to 35 students in, in a group. They would be made up of uh, students from different countries in different locations. Our actual primary focus was to make sure the students were culturally mixed. Um, we didn't have people where possible sitting in the same physical location. So typically a team would have an Irish person in Korea, a German person in Finland, a Korean person in Ireland, a Korean person in, in Germany, and that would be the team. So we forced these teams together because the principle behind the course was that when you go into business, um, teams are formed um, not through your friendships and your relationships, they're just formed um, through these, um, these mechanisms. Then we assign projects um, or options to students and they have to work together to decide what to do. In terms of the cultural aspect, um, yeah, we had to provide as part of this um, a cultural support uh, mechanism, uh, which was me. And that meant that while someone else was teaching the course, if students started to run into difficulty in terms of communication, um, we may have to intervene. So we had to intervene in one particular uh, case where we spoke to a student who felt they were working too hard. They thought it was um, you know, unfair in terms of how this worked, again, culturally. And the idea was just that how work is assigned and how you declare finishing work being a culturally different issue, which we hadn't foreseen. But we dealt with this successfully because we retained all the students 
and those students who have difficulty finished out the course regardless of those difficulties, but not without extra support um, from the likes of uh, KNU or, or from TU Dublin or our other partners. And um, we deliberately created a pressure environment, which meant that we were uh, required to provide additional support. And yeah, I think that worked and we've all learned a huge amount from it. Okay, good. Um, another question. Recently, the term COIL, C-O-I-L, has been gaining popularity, which means collaborative online, online international learning. How similar or dissimilar is your experience to COIL? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I haven't heard the term before, um, so I, I'm not sure where um, it's getting traction, but I think everything we've been doing has been focused on this uh, online international learning. Um, but again, I'd say there's probably two things that I see. One is some organizations uh, feel they can just put up some material uh, based on their own culture and it can be consumed internationally. And it's my experience is that that won't be as successful as engaging with a partner and creating content which is an international dimension or an awareness of um, the international dimension. And the very simple example might be that in Ireland, while we're very IT focused, um, how we teach and interact with our students and what we expect our students uh, to give us back in terms of um, material might be quite different um, to another country like China or, or Korea. And the questioning um, in Korea, for example, we find is heavily after we teach and uh, not during our teaching. So we need to provide different mechanisms for feedback. Whereas in Ireland, we tend to get um, a lot of direct feedback um, while we're actually teaching. And even if we're online, people want to, to break in and talk. So we have to build internationally aware programs. So yeah, it, it's a good idea if people are focusing on this. Okay. Um, you mentioned that students can control their pace of learning. So this question is, so does this create a learning bubble? Is there still room for competition? Um, competition. I, I think all education, uh, sometimes we, we feel that competition is with our other students. And my personal opinion is that that's not the reality. The, person, the competition you should be in is how, how well you can perform. So um, if you're competing against another student and you think this is the world, then your world is extremely small. So we use competition sometimes to get students just to, to work harder, but that's not the only way to, to do that. So um, what I actually meant by the pace of learning is that some students, when you explain the concept or, or go through a problem, will understand immediately. And other students will have to review it four or five times. Our primary aim is that the learning outcome is achieved. And that can be done, um, again, if you consume the knowledge instantly or by going over it four or five times. And I think technology and having things online which explain things um, helps some students which may struggle on one concept. And unfortunately, struggling on a concept can knock you out of the next piece of learning. So, um, so I think there's quite a lot of things in there, but I, I do find that um, this does bring lots of students who could fall out of the system uh, back into it. Mm. And I think we just got one time for just one more question. Um, says, hello, would you be able to uh, explain how you work with the time difference between Europe and Asia? For example, when did you run the lectures and the seminars? Um, sure. So when we work with uh, China and Korea, we have an eight and nine hour difference. Um, the very first thing um, when we select any lecture to build or run courses in Asia is that we request flexibility. So that means we will run our classes here as early as possible and the students um, in the partner usually run their classes as late as possible. So eight, nine hours is doable. Uh, Twelve hours may be a little bit more tricky. Um, but I think with Asia, it's perfectly fine. We've been running courses in China and in Korea in terms of the global classroom for, for four years now. And there's been no issues with that. Great. Well, thank you, Paul. Very interesting. And a lot of questions coming in there. Um, but we have to move forward. Um, so now our next speaker is Adriana Lasic from the University of Ljubljana. 
School of Economics uh, and Business in Slovenia, which they claim is at the heart of Europe. And this is conceivably true when you see these beautiful scenes of Lake Bled and the medieval castle in the center of the capital city, Ljubljana. But most important for today is the Ljubljana Summer School, which is organized by Adriana and which truly attracts students from all over the world with over 400 participants from over 20 countries. Adriana is responsible for organizing everything, including special events for students and the visiting academics. Um, now at this point, I would like to mention one of our KNU professors who has been teaching at the Ljubljana Summer School for the last seven years, Professor Inbong Ha. In fact, Professor Ha signed the first MOU between KNU and the University of Ljubljana back in 2006, when he was Dean of KNU College of Economics and Business. However, this year, when he was offered the chance to teach online at the Ljubljana Summer School, he declined as he felt he would not be able to deliver his philosophy and passion via an online course. So I'm sure Adriana has a lot to share about the challenges, compromises and successes of switching the Ljubljana Summer School to an online format. So welcome Adriana. Hi, welcome everyone. Thank you for a nice introduction, Lord. It, it was nice to see the, the photos to remind me. So preparing for an online school, well, actually we were not ready for this drastic change. So as you can see on the photos, um, our main promotion of the program was also in connection to promoting Slovenia, uh, city of Ljubljana, uh, many social events we organized during the program, um, sports activities, weekend trips around Slovenia and neighboring countries, because we like to say that we are in the heart of Europe, so students always have a lot of opportunities to travel around. But somehow we ended up with uh, taking Zoom photos, as today, at this conference. Um, so yeah, it was basically really, uh, really, really difficult to, to switch and we had many doubts uh, at the beginning. Um, as I'm the expert, summer school's expert community within the IA, uh, EIAE um, organizational board, um, I used the chance to actually get in touch with my colleagues who also organized uh, summer programs um, to talk to them, to ask them about the opinion, their opinion about uh, doing something like this uh, online because none of us actually had experience with that. We know that many things do run uh, online, um, several courses on the many different platforms, but um, programs like the summer school we organize, uh, well, they were never actually offered in an online format. So it was really tricky when we started to think about it. So actually in April, uh, the discussions started and I scheduled a meeting with my colleagues to ask them, you know, uh, to talk about um, what should be changed. Uh, how do we see an online format of this kind of thing? Um, how do we offer the experiential part to students because this was really one of the keys of the program. Uh, we were all, all concerned about the academic quality and outcomes because we were not sure if, if um, they can be the same. Um, of course, the big question was the different time zones. Um, in April, when we started thinking about the online uh, format, we had more than 200 applications already for, for the regular summer school. So the first thing I did I contacted the registered students, I contacted the partner universities and of course the course leaders uh, who were supposed to teach in Ljubljana in July. And we had uh, 29 courses uh, actually um, on schedule and more than 30 course leaders from different countries. Um, so it was really challenging to get all the feedbacks from all three parties uh, at the same time and as soon as possible because you know, time is running fast and if we wanted to go online, we were, we said, okay, if we do it, we have to announce it in May, beginning of May to have enough time 
to prepare everything and you know to promote again the new format of the program so um, we mainly ask the course leaders about the time zones, the appropriate uh, time slots they could teach. Um, and of course, we were asking students, um, are they willing to follow the course online? And uh, in this, um, what do they think the um, tuition fee should be like? And of course, many of them said that it should be reduced. Um, we were not sure about credit recognition. So this was one of the main questions for partner universities. Would they recognize an online summer school? Because for them as well, this was something new. Uh, so many actually uh, denied it. So we ended up losing quite a lot of students from our partner universities who have been sending quite a, a large groups of students uh, every year. Uh, we believe that it would be harder to attract students because you end up promoting only the course and the course content without the beautiful scenery of your country, of the city, of all the optional activities you usually provide. And of course, it's less financially sustainable. So um, many doubts, but also quite a lot of reasons for going online. So um, the main reason in the end was to actually offer students the opportunity to, to earn the ECTS credits because due to the um, COVID situation around the world, many of them had to end their uh, exchange mobility um, earlier and they didn't gain the credit that they planned to gain. So if we would all end up canceling all summer schools, I think many students would face uh, difficulties to, to end their study year or to end their um, pro study program. So um, this was the main reason to, to go forward with the online format. And of course, this was also the possibility to attract new students. So we did realize in the end that uh, in this way also attract uh, students from other institutions, um, students who don't like to travel, uh, students who work and don't have time to come to Ljubljana for, for three weeks. Um, so it was really an opportunity to mainly explore and to test uh, new possibilities. Um, and of course, there was a lot of discussion with our school management. Um, so we had a meeting about the tuition fee, the teaching fees. Basically, we had to reformat uh, everything. So, but of course, the feedback from our course leaders and students were, was positive about the online format. So we decided to, to go for it. And uh, we announced it at the beginning uh, of May. So the setup was, uh, yes, well, because I'm responsible for the oral program. It was basically up to me to, to set up everything from, from the start. Um, so we adjusted the program, uh, program format, meaning that usually the summer school uh, is held for three weeks. Um, because in between we give them uh, a few days off for you know, a longer weekend so they can travel on, on Fridays. They also get an extra day for, for studying. Um, so at the beginning I thought, okay, it's online, people you know, it's more difficult to sit in front of the computer um, for such a long period. Uh, so we decided to take out those uh, days off and we um, formatted the program to two weeks of lectures. So meaning from Monday to Friday for two weeks. And then the final examination was done um, on Monday in the third week. So we basically finished uh, earlier. Uh, of course, due to different time zones, we had to set up a new timetable as well. Um, so after discussing with my colleagues and checking the, you know, the websites of our partner institutions, seeing who's going online, of course, <laughs> you need to communicate with people, you know, because we can help each other. So basically I realized that the majority will offer courses more in the afternoon uh, European time. So we also decided to offer courses. So we offer two courses from one till 4 p.m. Ljubljana time and the majority was offered from 4 till 7 p.m. Uh, Ljubljana time. So it was morning for students from United States, late evening for Asian students, so it was doable for, for everyone. And of course, um, when we were setting up the course list, we had to reduce the number. So from 29 courses, we decided to only offer nine courses because 
we had to think about so many different factors. So we had a lot of new course leaders on program. We didn't know them in person. We had no experience with them. So basically we decided not to go online uh, with them because I think you have to know <laughs> the, the person you work with. Like Paul mentioned, you have to really openly communicate as well with your partner institutions. So it felt more comfortable to go for this with people we already know. And many of them have been teaching in this program for more than five years. Um, so when they confirm that they can deliver uh, their course uh, in this online format, uh, we decided to go on with nine courses. And it was, um, in the end, we also ended up canceling two more courses because there were not enough uh, applications. So yeah, in the end, we offered seven courses for 129 students, which was a great number. I was really happy to see the outcome. And students were for, from 20 countries uh, of study and actually 35 different nationalities, which is a really a great diversity. Um, so yeah, recalculation of costs, of course, uh, many summer schools, we earn money with our programs, of course, but uh, you have to take into account that with an online format, basically, the main cost is the teaching fee and you have some costs with uh, online materials, um, technology. Basically, we use the technology we have at our School of Economics and Business. Um, teachers were using Zoom. So, you know, most of them have their licensed versions anyway at their home institution. So with that, we didn't bear um, a lot of cost. Um, but we ended up reducing the tuition fee for students because uh, we always promoted this fee as a program fee. So when you don't have the optional program, you don't organize events, lunch, uh, accommodation, of course, you have to reduce the fee. Um, and students were expecting that because a lot of them wrote in the feedback that they would not join the program if the, the fee stayed uh, the same. So of course, uh, academics had to revise their course syllabuses because you have to adapt it for the online format. And many of our partner institutions were, of course, mainly asking about how the final examination will be done. So, you know, semesters were finishing and course leaders already had some experience with how to do, deal with the uh, final written exams. Um, so, yeah, basically this was the main question from the partner university. So I had to discuss this with every course leader individually to make sure that also the final examination uh, is done and that students don't cheat and, you know, use all possible uh, ways to prevent that. Um, and yeah, of course, we had to update the program website, the complete application form, because if people are not arriving, traveling to Ljubljana, there's many information you don't need to request from them anymore. So yeah, it was a lot, a lot of work for, let's say, three weeks, four weeks, um, very demanding, but we made it uh, and made the switch. Um, and a very, very difficult uh, thing um, was changing the mindset. So I've been doing this for seven years now. And my role with being a summer school manager, well, it's, it's demanding. So I'm basically here 24-7 for students, dealing with accommodation problems, organizing lunch, social activities. So, you know, you have to take care of everything and, and try to make everyone happy. So you have um, activities for course leaders, you have activities for students, events for everyone involved so they can meet uh, together. Um, and yeah, with the online format, you lose that. So basically I was in between the course leaders and students and I was trying to learn about the technologies and, you know, offer the overall support so that the materials were uh, published on uh, the platforms, um, the Zoom is working, uh, but you, you cannot, uh, I mean, you can help them, but you know, uh, people are in their countries, in their offices, in their homes, you don't know if their internet will work or not, as usually also it was the same for the regular um, courses during the semester. Um, so yeah, you, you set up, try to set up a uh, platforms that you use, but those platforms are the ones we used in Ljubljana. So 
I didn't know what kind of platforms our students uh, were students using in their own institution. So yeah, definitely, you know, they had to learn. They had to, many of them didn't know Canvas. We use Canvas for, for study materials. So they had to, you know, learn how to log in. It's a specific system in, in our institution. And, you know, they had to go through tutorials to, to learn about it. But luckily it was quite uh, easy for them. So we didn't have um, a lot of uh, problems with that. And of course it was new for course leaders as well. So um, at the beginning, I didn't set up a format and say, okay, you all have to teach on Zoom and you all have to use this. I asked because I think, <laughs> you know, it was new for everyone. So I didn't want to force them to use the technology they're not uh, aware of and haven't used it before. Um, but luckily most of them were using Zoom already. So this was the easy part and they managed to, to get to know Canvas very quickly. And it was very, um, it's an interactive platform, so they could do, you know, many quizzes, um, midterm exams and things like that. So uh, in the end, they really uh, were happy with uh, both platforms. We had courses which preferred Microsoft Teams. So it's really, I think it's good if you leave it up to the course leaders to decide. And if you have the option to offer them this uh, uh, possibility to choose, um, to make it easier on them because uh, a lot of them said that, you know, teaching online a summer course is very, very challenging. So at the beginning, like Lorna mentioned, Professor Ha declined <laughs> because he felt that he cannot deliver the, this, uh, his course online in the same way. And I had some course leaders who were in doubt at the beginning, but then said, okay, let's try it. Uh, so in the end, it was an overall very, very good experience for them, but also very uh, demanding in terms of time. So basically the big difference for them was also because they were uh, at their home institutions, uh, most of them working in the morning and then teaching for the Ljubljana summer school in the afternoon. So um, that was quite a lot of work for them. Um, and when we shifted uh, and started promoting the online uh, program, basically we didn't promise uh, students uh, social activities, many interactions and things like that, we mainly promoted the courses and the course content. So we were trying to make sure that we offer a good um, uh, quality of courses. Um, so of course, I've been doing this for many years. All the course leaders have been involved in the program for many years. So we all know how the normal summer school works, uh, but we forgot that, you know, we are also getting applications from people who don't know anything about a normal summer school. So why do we worry about it so much, you know? We also had students who participated last year um, and still now after the online program, they were really happy also with this uh, version. So it's really also, I think we have really high expectations from ourselves because we know what we can offer here. So you really have to work on your own mindset and and try to forget about some things and just focus that you bring the most out of the online format as well. So what can you offer besides courses? Uh, I talked to some of the colleagues who actually also uh, did the online program. So of course you can do welcome farewell sessions. So uh, we did a live welcome session for all participants and course leaders. Uh, our dean invited, uh, welcomed them. So we did that for this prior to the start of the program because we started on Monday. We didn't want to intervene during the weekend. So we said, okay, let's wait Thursday before the start of the program on Monday. And to just give them, you know, to welcome them, to give them instructions um, all for Monday, how to start, how to log in and everything. So they had enough time to, to get ready for, for Monday. Uh, we organized a few informal meetings with students. So um, we just, you know, announced, okay, Let's meet on Wednesdays at this time. If you, want, if you want to join and you have time, we would love to meet you. You can meet uh, the team. We will do some ice breaking games, quizzes. Um, we had nice plans for them to how we would, you know, how they would mingle online and um, just get to know each other in, in breakout rooms. But uh, I think from all the 129 students uh, at the first informal meeting, seven of them joined which is a very low number. 
Um, but the students that did join, you know, it was actually in the end. And we had a nice chat. Uh, they talked to each other, you know, shared their own stories. So they really liked it, but they were also surprised that not many students joined. So um, I think this uh, informal part of, of the programs is really, we need to think about it a lot and see what can actually be transferred and try to get a feedback from students how to do it. You know, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, we had informal meetings with course leaders. That was easier because we already know each other. So it was a nice uh, way of having uh, informal chats during the evenings. Um, and they basically explained, you know, if they had any problems, uh, how, how the environment is in, in the online classroom and things like that. And it's a nice way so they can share, share among each other also the, the experience. Um, one of my colleagues from Oslo, she also showed me how they organized the platform for informal communication. So they used uh, Microsoft Teams. And it's actually a nice way how you can engage, try to engage students. So they were promoting uh, promotional videos of the country, uh, interesting facts about the country, the city. Um, it's also possible to organize uh, specific groups for only the particular course participants. Um, but she also said that uh, maybe 50% of the participants use this platform. Um, either they didn't have time or, you know, you're using so many different platforms for different things. So it's also confusing for them. And um, so, yeah, in the end, they don't care that much about the informal part, but basically focus on the courses and the time slots that uh, predicted for the courses. So in the end, uh, of course, we had to reform in the evaluation uh, form as well, because the questions you want to ask in the end are quite different, you know, and uh, you can uh, get rid of the overall program questions because, you know, we didn't organize anything in Ljubljana. So uh, basically it was about the course content, the delivery, about the course leader, the technology, if they faced any specific problems, um, questions like this. So, uh, but in the end, Students said it was a great learning experience um, and it changed uh, the way how they look at remote learning. So um, that was a very positive thing. Um, they mentioned that the course leader could prepare a more detailed uh, technical instructions beforehand uh, about the software they will use, uh, specific programs they will use. Of course, everything was written in the course syllabus, but then when it gets to the practical part, you know, students are uh, differently di digitally skilled. So it's, it can be quite uh, demanding at the beginning to set up everything and, and to explain everything to students. Um, they had quite more flexibilities in terms of time. Uh, many students wrote to me that, you know, because they work at home, uh, it's perfect that the classes are in the afternoon, uh, of course, for the European students, because they work in the morning. So. Um, this was a, be a better possibility for them. Um, and a lot of them mentioned that they would prefer still to have the course delivered in the classroom, um, basically because of the group work. And of course, they would get more uh, social interactions. Um, the feedback from course leaders was also quite positive. Again, a great learning experience for them as well. Um, it was very demanding, uh, but in the end, they managed to, to deliver. Um, they understand that if we have to do this online again next year, they will definitely reformat the course syllabuses even more because um, it has to be really adapted to the, for the online format. Um, for some, it was difficult to track actual presence because people are at home, they can use many different excuses. You don't know, should you believe it, should you not? Uh, like in the regular classroom, some are very interested from the beginning, very interactive. Um, some don't care, they just sit in the classroom and wait till it's finished. So it was quite similar in the online environment. So you had students with so many different excuses why they cannot turn on the camera, you know, disappearing from classes. So what uh, course leaders said, you know, they were calling out their names, trying to, you know, engage them in the classroom. But uh, they all said that 20 students per class is the maximum uh, they would take because otherwise it's, it's difficult to track. If they're all there, 
Of course, if students couldn't use the camera because of the internet connection, that was okay. But of course, if they told it at the beginning, not for the reason to disappear from the class. So, um, and many of them said that they switched from group work to individual assignments, uh, especially the ones they had around 10 to 11 students. That was doable um, because they found it hard to, to set up the groups and actually have that group team, team spirit evolve uh, in the online classroom. Um, and I also asked them if they would prefer to keep the three week format or you know do the new two week format in case of online. Um, and they had mixed feelings. Um, the two weeks was okay because you know, every day you have to sit in front of the computer for three hours for the same course. And it's quite demanding for them because uh, course leaders were receiving a lot of emails this time. You know, in the classroom, you finish the course, students come to you and you discuss it after the course and you can solve many issues very quickly. But in this way, they were receiving a lot of emails from students all the time. So um, they basically worked till late night, you know, and then in the morning starting all over. So um, in terms of the length, you really have to consider like, uh, and again, I have to talk to the course leaders to, to go, you know, it really depends on each course of, of the format of the course and how they can do it. So if they prefer a longer, um, you know, a week more, it's feasible. So we will definitely consider um, to, to offer the online uh, program also in, in the three weeks. So they have enough time for all the lectures and enough time to prepare for the final assessment, um, them and the students as well. So I would say the experience was great, but I do want to offer the experience on campus in Ljubljana. Um, and for next year, well, we will start preparing for next year, of course. The first scenario will be the, the normal summer school here. Um, but of course, we will also have to start thinking about a blended hybrid summer school or completely online uh, as we did it uh, this year. So. Um, I'm already looking forward to talking to some of the uh, colleagues who are also organizing these kind of programs to see um, what is the future uh, in the following years for us. So this is all from my side. Thank you all. Thank you, Ariana. Wonderful. Big job that you managed to coordinate there. Um, so we've got, again, several questions here. Uh -huh. um, so the first one is, um, will you consider keeping an online option as part of your regular summer school? Will you kind of address that at the end? So you are thinking yeah. to do a hybrid version? Yes. Yeah? We are. Okay. But basically, of course, it's connection it, in connection to the technology, as Paul mentioned, you know, not every technology works. How to do it? Because in our case, we mainly work with course leaders from abroad. I think it's easier if you're working with your own uh, teaching staff at your university. So yeah. It's still to be considered, we will see. Then the other question was, was the online summer school more popular in particular countries? Uh, very popular for uh, students from Switzerland, I would say Germany. Um, so yeah, I think the main reason was a lot of them do work. So they preferred, you know, that, you know, they could still do the summer job they had or the regular job and still join the classes, you know, at, at 4 p.m. So this was really feasible for them. Um, so what about some point. of the, what about some of the countries then that were not participating? What, what countries were those ones? Australia, we did have a student from Australia, but you know, the time difference, like Paul mentioned, you know, mm -hmm. eight, nine hours is doable, but then if you have a 12 hour difference, well, then it's quite difficult, you know. I mean, we did get emails and people ask, you know, can our student join, you know, it would be late night for her, of course, if she can manage, no problem, but uh, it's quite difficult to do that for two weeks, uh, being, uh, staying up, you know, during late night, so. Okay, I have um, a question here from uh, Michael Collins from TU Dublin. Uh, due to difficulty in recruiting students for an online program, what strategy changes did you make to maximize student recruitment for your summer school? Well, that, uh, yeah, there wasn't a major strategy change uh, for this year because this shift was really unexpected. 
we basically just, you know, worked with the people who already registered and basically tried to keep them in the online format and keep, you know, and talk to partner universities. Will you recognize the courses or not? You know, many said yes, many said no. So um, it was really a testing ground for, for everyone. Some said, okay, let's, let's try it. We will send you a student and, and see, you know, what the, what the outcome is. Uh, but definitely because none of us planned this from the very start. So for next year, when we'll have to plan, I think both scenarios, we will definitely have to change the overall strategy. So, you know, you, you can reach out to more different countries, more different people, which is a good thing. I, I think Paul also mentioned that. Um, but yeah, I think we will start now. So from summer holidays, uh, we will basically start from scratch and, and start to rethink the whole um, strategy of the program. And I think everyone will have to deal with this now because this is not, this was not a change just for this year, but for the next upcoming years, because if you think about it, um, usually you organize accommodation as well for people who come for summer school. So what happens next? Do we have dormitories that can provide single rooms? Because I'm not sure that students would want to share rooms with two, three, four people, you know? So this is a ma major change. Again, everything you organize was for, in our case, was quite big events, you know? Many people on, on trips, uh, social events, you know, for 300, 400 people. So I'm not sure if, this could be done in the near future again. So definitely we have to rethink everything from the start now. I think you were very brave to actually try it this year, you know, when everybody was kind of still hands up in the air, like, what are we going to do? You actually did it. So I know a lot of people are, are so interested in, in your feedback. Can I, can I just ask you, what was the highlight of your uh, online summer school for you? What was the best moment? that you remember? Uh, I would say the informal gatherings. <laughs> Still, like I was really missing the social interaction because usually I have a big team working with me. You know, there's people everywhere all the time around me. So now I was alone in my office, <laughs> you know, and, and basically just chatting with people over email. So I was really happy, even if it was only five students who joined, but you know, you basically got to talk to them and, and you know, they shared their stories, they got to know you. So, and many of them said that, um, okay, it was great, but I wanna come back next year and to meet you in person and, and experience now this in Ljubljana, you know, so um, definitely I, I'm, you know, it was sad to see that they're not interacting that much. And I think a lot of them in the end, you know, commented, oh, you know, but you could organize something. Yeah, we did, but you didn't join. So <laughs> yeah, you, it, it's always the problem. You know, you, you just try to do so many things for everyone, but um, yeah. But in the end, I was really happy and, and really proud of the course leaders. So they took up the challenge and, and really did a great job. And I got a lot of really positive emails from students who wanted to specifically, you know, say how good the course leader was and then that the, you know, overall atmosphere was still good, even though online. So, you know, the, that was really a good thing. So the feedbacks this year are quite different, but also very positive. So I would say there is a future for an online thing as well, um, because I think traveling will be quite limited for many students now also from the, you know, the cost. Um, you know, I think the, the traveling will become more expensive, at least, you know, in the following years. So definitely, I think we all have to consider at least a blended uh, possibility if, if it can work. Yeah, it's exciting. And um, yeah. Michael has another follow up. He says, for classes that were popular with a large number of students, were they broken into smaller groups or kept together? Um, we had a lot of demand for a few courses, but we, we were sticking to the limit. So the limit was, uh, we said 20, 25. So I also asked the course leader, you know, can you manage 25? Because, you know, you have so much interest. Uh, we had a case when all the Swiss students, so 30, I think it was 30 of them, wanted to register for the same course. So I said, look, you know, this is a negotiations class. So you cannot be all classmates from Switzerland in this course, you know, it makes no sense. <laughs> and I also talked to their university and said, of course, you know, you, you have to limit it. They have to be with other students. So 
basically we had to say no to, to some of the students. If we knew in advance how many students would be interested and if it was the case that the professor is here, you know, um, I could maybe ask him to do another slot for, for this course, you know, so to repeat it. But for example, this uh, course leader was from Mexico. So, you know, when who, could he do it, you know? So there's so many limitations and you try to explain it to students, you know? So a lot of them were just, you know, trying to get in to earn the credits, you know, and they were not listening, you know, to all the uh, factors I was mentioning, but in the end they understood. So, um, but definitely for next year, from experience, we see which courses are, are popular because we try to repeat uh, some of them and then we always add some new ones. Um, so definitely that's also the option to not to do smaller groups, but maybe repeat the course um, in two slots. Okay, last question and you got one minute. Yeah. Um, <laughs> did you uh, or would you uh, in the future use any criteria to choose the academics who actually participate in the online courses? Uh, in, criteria um, would you use to select? Um, good question. <laughs> um, basically, we start with, you know, um, where the course leader comes from, so what's his, you know, CV experience. Then, of course, we focus on the offered course to see, is this, uh, you know, an interesting topic? Is it more of a basic thing that, you know, people usually listen at their regular study programs, you know, so it's a uh, many different factors we consider but yeah in an online version you do sell the course and the course content so you have to you know um, check the market and see you know and and always collaborate with with other uh, summer school organizers you know and ask them like you know which courses work for you you know or are there particular students from some countries you know who are more into it courses then you have students you know who are from you know more uh, an environment and the, where they just want to earn the credit. So they want to, you know, recognize a regular course back home, you know. So there's, you have to know your uh, group of people who are regularly coming, you know. So we have a very diverse uh, selection of people. It's from experience. So I know, you know, I know which courses Moroccan students are, you know, trying to take and then the Portuguese and then, for example, Scandinavia, they're more into IT, really cool new courses, you know because they don't focus so much on the earning the credit part, but basically learning something new. So uh, you have to know your audience and then with the online, you test. So you also get some new people and then, you know, you start with them. And then the word of mouth is very important as well for the future editions. Well, thank you, Adriana. Well done. Good job. You're all impressed with your efforts there for sure. <laughs> now, so our last guest, uh, speaker today is our own KNU professor, Dr. Troy Gurman from KNU Law School. Originally from Seattle, Washington, Troy joined KNU in 2010. However, he is also an attorney who practiced in Las Vegas, where he represented some of the major casinos. He then moved to Wall Street, where his clients included various international banks, and most recently, during a special sabbatical, he was the Chief Banking Officer and General Counsel for the Export-Import Bank of the United States. Quite a lineup. But happily for us, in his heart, Troy is a teacher and he loves teaching. By the way, he also spent four summers teaching at the Ljubljana Summer School. Small world, eh? So I'm very happy to welcome Troy to share his insights on a cleverly alliterated title, Professional Perspectives on Practical Problems in a Pandemic. Troy, hi there. It's over to you now. Uh, thank you, Lauren, for that very kind introduction and greetings, everyone. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, I, I guess, be the, uh, the, the final uh, content uh, provider for this particular uh, gathering. Uh, and I really appreciate the insights uh, from both uh, Paul and uh, Adriana. Um, I know both of them and very much respect the work that they do and uh, hope to return to the Ljubljana Summer School sometime in the near future. Uh, 
I'm primarily a law and policy guy. So when I was asked to present something for this conference, I started to think about really just kind of the policy perspective. What have we done that's worked and what hasn't worked? And uh, as academics, as institutions, and also uh, in our broader communities with governments and others that we're involved with. And so um, if we, uh, let's see here. Okay. So if, if you look at my contents here, the first thing we'll do is we'll just look at a couple of slides uh, where I'll be discussing uh, roles and considerations related to professors in international education. And then I'll focus on teaching and research while revisiting some of the issues and themes that I hit upon in, in those first couple of slides. Okay. Um, so with respect to teaching, um, of course, professors are central to the proper functioning of uh, any international program. We teach all over the world, and as discussed in uh, the previous presentations, we use technology to teach audiences beyond our borders. And I have some experience having done that uh, myself for the University of Maryland, which teaches for the University which teaches for the United States military. And uh, I've actually taught uh, students in war zones actually actively involved in combat, which has its own challenges, but technology does definitely have its place in uh, communication and uh, teaching across borders. Now we conduct and oversee field work. We also engage in uh, internships and various forms of laboratory work at home and abroad. Uh, as far as research goes, of course, we're involved in our research in our home countries, but there's a lot of international research that we do that's important. And we do this with our colleagues and also involve students as well. We can do this individually and collaboratively. Uh, we lead and participate in cultural activities, uh, formal and informal. And as uh, Adriana pointed out, uh, there's some real issues with you know, engaging in these cultural activities particularly in the current environment. I'm not really sure what to do about that, but uh, even before her presentation, this is something I just wanted to put out there. How well can these be done during a pandemic? And I haven't talked with anyone that has any great solutions, but I think it's something we really need to consider. Uh, and then uh, with respect to industry and academic cooperation, of course, uh, professors are also involved in various aspects of research. Um, setting up internships and being involved in consulting and other things with our industrial partners. But ultimately, we use our connections and our know-how to provide support for and connect on an international basis for our universities. Um, there are no solutions, there are only trade-offs. Uh, this is a statement that clearly fits our COVID-19 environment now, and I expect that it will continue to uh, be something that impacts us in the future. In many instances, overnight, as we all know, we were uh, sent out of our face-to-face -face, uh, comfort zones for many of us and went into all online formats. Initially, there was little consideration placed on anything other than physical health and, and for good reason, particularly with the pandemic that we knew so little about initially. Um, but as we move into our new normal, whatever that may look like, Considerations of mental health also need to be added to our physical health. Uh, economic considerations, uh, both personal and institutional, need to be thought through. And of course, uh, uh, pedag pedagogical considerations with respect to content, delivery, and reception from our students need to be very strongly considered. Um, and then, of course, the time travel technology and training considerations. Once again, uh, we have uh, uh, some repeated uh, lettering there. Um, so let's just talk about this briefly. With respect to health considerations, we need to, of course, very carefully consider the physical health of all of our stakeholders, but be very mindful of the physical health of those who are most vulnerable. And this is a particular concern for professors, but also for administrators and even some non-traditional students who find themselves particularly vulnerable because of age. And uh, we need to be cognizant of those issues and maybe make uh, some allowances for them to, uh, when other colleagues are moving into the classroom, maybe find others who are less vulnerable to take their places or augment what they're doing. 
uh, as far as mental health is concerned, uh, this has come to loom large, uh, particularly due to issues related to uncertainty, anxiety, loneliness, and other things uh, that, that have arisen during this uh, COVID-19 uh, time. Um, as far as economic considerations, uh, there are a lot of issues uh, at higher governmental le levels, university and departmental levels, uh, professorial and also student levels that we have to think through. For example, with tuition and other things uh, that, that are uh, uh, definitely impacted and what seems to be fair for our students and what can actually work for our institutions as well. Now, with respect to professors, there are real issues. Uh, many of the metrics against which professors are measured, uh, teaching feedback, uh, our research results and other things have been severely impacted uh, because of COVID-19. So there have become fundamental questions about the fairness of metrics related to teaching on new platforms, especially when little or no training has been given for such teaching. Or worse yet, the platforms just end up being completely uh, incapable of handling what we need to do. And we find it out a little too late. And there have been some instances of that as well. And having negative feedback from students coming back to haunt professors. And how do we deal with those types of issues? Um, there are also issues such as being stuck at home that have interfered with many research agendas. As a result, reasonable universities in many places have extended tenure tracks and made many uh, adjustments to performance evaluations. And these types of things are important for professors so that they feel comfortable not only in engaging their regular activities, but also uh, helping their universities engage in their international activities as well. As far as pedagogy is concerned, I'll discuss this a, a bit later in more detail. With respect to the four T's, the time, the travel, the technology and training considerations, of course, we all have limited amounts of time that uh, we can use, uh, and many of us have been taxed in this regard over the past uh, semester or so, dealing with um, bringing our classes or creating new classes into an online environment. Um, and this often takes reimagining courses, and once again, receiving and providing training. Uh, there are also demands that I, I've learned about and read about and talked to professors about that have been placed on them by different institutions, such as making themselves available online for office hours for various time zones, as students are now stuck at home all over the world, on delivering the same course both in person and online, but only getting credit for teaching one course while they're really doing two very different courses. And also uh, there are issues with having to prepare for being both online and also teaching face-to-face -face while professors are waiting for administrators to decide which type of format they're actually going to be using or being told that they need to prepare both ways as there may be decisions made to flip or switch back and forth depending on health considerations. So these, these are some things that can be very taxing on time. Obviously, tra travel has been uh, curtailed during uh, the COVID-19 uh, period, and uh, we need to very seriously consider, uh, you know, how we can uh, work within our universities, but also with uh, the governments that we know and uh, work with to make sure that we can support necessary travel for uh, our professors, for our students, and for our administrators. And I think that's something that, that we can all uh, work on and, and focus on so that we can support our international missions. Um, <clears throat> as far as technology, of course, we've heard about some of the issues with moving courses online, uh, but there's also other technology that we need to think about, and that's health care technology that we can use to prevent, diagnose, and deal with uh, COVID-19 or whatever other awful pathogens might come our way in the future. Uh, I've been working closely with leaders in Korea and the United States in particular, in industry and labs, and I'm convinced that there are various ways that we can get back into the classroom, labs, and other more traditional educational environments if we spend the time and resources and have a little bit of courage. Um, in supporting and adopting practical health measures. And the reality is, uh, I think we can do a lot of this 
And I think many of us have seen that we can do a lot of this without a lot of high technology, just using maybe uh, some simple apps, for example, like the ones my children use in their school here in Korea, where on a daily basis, they do health checks before they go to school. They wear face masks, social distancing, um, heat uh, screening for uh, different people. Those types of things are not that expensive and can be done in a way that makes it possible for students to attend schools. And we've seen it here in Korea done fairly well without people getting sick. It hasn't been extremely difficult, though some people might complain about masks. Um, then as far as training is concerned, of course, we all got thrown online very quickly. Some people like Paul have a lot of experience with working online and uh, I guess some of us may envy him. Um, but regardless of that, it is imperative that we have adequate training for professors and students. And I'd also point out for our technical support personnel. Um, I ran into some issues where I called on our technical support and they didn't know how to answer my questions at times. So make sure that everybody is uh, ready, willing and able to work on that new technology. Now, um, let's move to the next slide. Okay, when I refer to tech, teaching and practical problems in teaching. Um, I'm talking about the types of issues that are getting in the way of us being effective teachers. Not efficient, but effective. And so when I think about that, I uh, think about this year, and as we've all been thrust into this emergency situation, in many instances, uh, I know that I felt like the person on this slide. Uh, and uh, how about you? Um, I know our students felt like this too. Uh, frustration mounted, professors, administrators, and students alike were, and in many cases still are, uncertain of what their educational environment is and what their environment will look like uh, in the coming months and even possibly years. And so we have to be creative about not only how we make planning for these things, but how we communicate effectively with all of our stakeholders about how we are making our decisions and what the most likely scenarios are so that they can plan. And this includes administrators, professors, technical support people, and of course, our students as well. Um, so of course, uh, it's easier said than done, but we need to be very deliberate about particularly the communications piece so we get uh, the results. Now, of course, professors are professionals. As uh, David Piper uh, in 1992 pointed out, professors meet all four of the typical criteria of professional life. Uh, we have common bodies of knowledge. We share a pro uh, professional identity uh, that goes with us. It's very important to us. We're accountable. And this is a very important part. We're accountable for the effects of what we do in our teaching and research, not just what we do, but the effects upon others, and we have professional bodies that enforce our codes of practice and accreditation and so forth. So as with most professionals, our work quality uh, is critically important to our identity. It is also very, the very stuff that students need and want to receive from us in order for them to succeed. So in this environment, we see teaching in particular but also research and in the arts exhibition and performances being seriously impacted. Focusing on teaching, if we are to make more online teaching the norm, then we do need to have more training from uh, people who are qualified to do that training and have dialogues about the appropriate platforms for what we're using and being trained on. But besides technology training, I believe we also need to have more training about how we help uh, each other deal with uh, particularly mental health support and other issues that have come up during this time and how we can access those resources, which is of course different from uh, institution to institution and country to country. Uh, <clears throat> let's go to the next slide, okay. Uh, teaching online during a pandemic. Now, one of the questions that I think it has already been touched upon quite a bit so far as conceptually, what works online and what doesn't. So I started thinking about, okay, what's least difficult down to what's most difficult. Of course, uh, as, as I've talked with different students and professors, 
uh, courses that can be delivered online with results com comparable to those of face-to-face -face courses are largely theory and basic concept courses, uh, legal theory, engineering theory, music theory. Uh, these can all be delivered online fairly easily. On the other end, the most difficult courses, these are ones that are nearly impossible, if not impossible, to be delivered online. Um, <clears throat> these would be musical performance courses, uh, chemistry labs. I, I don't know how you could safely have a chemistry lab in everyone's individual home. Uh, be quite difficult. And so there are limitations to what we've been able to do online. And between the middle, uh, or between the left and the right, of course, we have some courses where we have to be a little more creative, uh, or maybe you might have a, a slight bit of difficulty in delivering some aspects of our course, but we're still able to do it um, relatively effectively online. Okay. <clears throat> now, this last category is what I really want to focus on. Um, <clears throat> this, these are items that will never be efficient because they will never be fully effective. Teaching and learning will not be able to be done online in any meaningful way. And as one of my colleagues in mechanical engineering here at KNU told me, doing labs online is a complete disaster. It's an impossible situation. Theory, no problem, but labs, impossible. What about field work? Uh, some of that can go on if you're allowed out, but if you're gathering biological specimens in the wilderness, um, that may be the safest thing you could actually do. But other types of field work, for example, anthropological field work, might be completely limited or impossible. And so we have to keep those types of things in mind when we are thinking about policies, once again, related to uh, courses and also uh, research that's uh, supported and permitted to be done. Um, <clears throat> So ultimately, what we need to do is prioritize getting students and professors, though, back into the classrooms and labs and performance halls, particularly in this most difficult category on the right. And uh, some institutions I, I've read about and talked to people in, such as UCLA in the USA, are taking this approach, and I highly uh, support that and encourage it. Uh, going online. Uh, is a solution for some cloud courses and some disciplines, but ultimately is a sledgehammer approach that shortchanges many uh, students and educators. Now, I've read many articles uh, lately by online education enthusiasts saying COVID-19 has just forced us to go online in some uh, inevitable, into the inevitable future of online teaching. And while that may be true for some disciplines, uh, Going online for all subjects has been like taking a sledgehammer to our universities. Frankly, it has proven very destructive to maintaining the integrity of effective teaching, learning, and research in various disciplines. Um, I was talking with my daughter, actually, who's a university student who was in her first semester when her university in the United States was forced online, and I asked her, well, how did your courses go? She said, well, I'll give my professors an A for effort, but as far as what they were actually able to accomplish. I don't wanna really tell you what I think. Um, and I'm afraid too many of our students might have those same types of opinions. What we need to do is come up with more refined approaches for different disciplines and types of courses and research. And particularly if we're going to continue to have to rely on a lot of online, uh, let's say based technology, I think this means we'll have to reach out across disciplines and reach out to our friends in technology and find ways to uh, com come closer to uh, meeting our objectives as far as educators might be concerned. Okay. Uh, with respect to research, um, being involved in international research and research events is critical. These things help individuals and teams so that we can gain experience of personal value, we can have informal exposure to research, and of course people. Uh, people are what lies at the heart of our research so often in making connections uh, between uh, uh, ourselves and our students, our colleagues in various, uh, in our own fields and other fields, and also with leaders in our field. 
and understanding different solutions to problems across the world is also a critical part of you know, the applied research that makes universities so valuable, such as seeing how different legal systems uh, and even scientists in particular, actually not even in particular, have been dealing with COVID-19 and other challenges that come about. So it's important that we make sure that um, we have budgets and regulations that continue to support uh, the, this, regu this type of research into the future. Now, one of the most important things that I think uh, we all recognize is that, of course, humans are social creatures. Uh, many of our greatest discoveries and innovations take place in collaborative environments. Beyond that, just maintaining mental health as well as physical health related to that requires that we interact with each other. There is a reason why solitary confinement, for example, is considered a harsh, harsh uh, punishment in prisons. Now, do we wish the same thing upon our university community members? Of course not. But even if we didn't intend it, that's what happened to some of our, uh, our colleagues and some of our students and friends over the past few months. Um, even before COVID-19, loneliness was already a major public health issue in many countries. And we've just seen it get worse with isolation. I had one student in particular um, who uh, I, I was uh, working with this past uh, semester, who it turned out was in her first semester at the school. She knew nobody and she was isolated completely at home. Uh, her mother worked and she hardly ever saw her. And so for months, she was isolated at home with no one to talk to. And I started talking to her weekly every Friday and uh, eventually started uh, linking her up with other students. But we need to be very cognizant of what's going on with our students and with uh, our professors uh, and other colleagues and make sure that they're not sad, that they're being taken care of. And it's important that we do that. Um, that we demonstrate that aspect of uh, humanity. <clears throat> now, uh, I think at, at the previous um, presentations made it very clear that all online can't be the new normal. I think there's a lot of space for online education and I've been involved with it, as I mentioned before, um, in, in various formats. And I think there is a, a really important place for technology in delivering uh, educational um, products as well as in conducting our research. But um, I'm convinced that uh, online has its limits and it can't be particularly the, uh, the way that we carry on all conferences in the future or all presentations of research. Um, there's a lot that we need to do that can only be do, done in a reasonable way, face-to-face. -face. <clears throat> um, I had a few things I was going to mention there, but they've really been covered uh, by, by uh, Paul and Adriano already, so I'm not going to belabor some points about how, how we uh, deal with some things online. But I do want to focus on, once again, the fact that uh, we can't have dance recitals online. You can't do art installations very well online. Some you can, but many you can't. And of course, chemistry labs, biology labs, those types of things can't be done uh, in, in any meaningful way uh, online. So there are certain things that we just need to get together and do uh, or find some way to provide resources for people to do them in a, in a different environment. Uh, as intellectuals, we need to share ideas in formal and informal settings. And right now, as I look on the screen, I see everybody's muted. Uh, that means I'm talking, you're listening. And that's great uh, for me right now, and hopefully for you too, is, uh, you're hopefully getting something out of this. But this is a very formal uh, type of environment, and these types of online presentations uh, tend to be very formalistic with respect to their timeframes and agendas and they don't leave a lot of room for creative collaboration. Uh, we do have some Q&A here, which is great, but there's a lot more that we can do uh, offline um, and in, in 
informal settings. And as Adriana pointed out, it's really hard for a lot of people to get into the online informal settings. And so we ultimately get back to the reality that this is where the magic happens. If you look at this slide, you see people uh, sitting down, talking to each other face to face. Uh, maybe you won't be able to do this without masks for some time, in, in, uh, for some time. who knows how long. But I, I want to uh, uh, point out that this is really our objective, to find ways that we can get closer to this, where there are things like happen chance, where we just happen to meet together and talk to people um, and discuss details of research and collaboration and build relationships that will foster both personal and professional growth. We can't lose sight of the benefits of being together. And uh, I hope that uh, we can find ways that through forums like this until we can meet together to share our ideas and concepts but eventually get back to that and have that objective in mind. Uh, this last slide that I wanted to share with you is actually a picture of me uh, with a bunch of my students. And I want to tell you quickly how this, what this is and how it came about. A few years ago, um, I took a group of six students on an educational tour to Vietnam. Um, this is a meeting that we had with the president of the uh, Bar Association in Vietnam and a couple of the law professors there. This came about because I attended an in-person international symposium here at KNU in a research field outside of my own. I met a professor from Vietnam National University, Hanoi, and in the hallway, and we just started chatting. And that led us to uh, him handing me off to some people in the law school who were in charge of international efforts. And that led to me having a lecture tour in Vietnam. And then later, uh, I returned that year to uh, Vietnam with these six students. Uh, our primary focus was uh, meeting with practitioners and with professors and law students while we were there. But as happens with many, uh, times when you travel ab abroad, we had some non-structured time and we were able to fill up with this meeting, for example, with the Bar Association pre president. And one of the great things we were able to do is actually meet with the chief judge of um, Vietnam in private meetings and then watch him in action in court. And those are the types of things that really make international education so great. And I hope we can get back to that soon. Anyway, I appreciate the opportunity to t talk with all of you, and thank you very much. Thank you, Troy. Excellent. Absolutely, it's the magic uh, that we're missing in so many ways right now. Now, we do have some questions, first from uh, Pearson from Wintech, New Zealand. Uh, he says, my question to Troy is, what measures have you taken to engage industry stakeholders in regards to research internships during the pandemic? I think you, talk, you, you touched briefly on this at the beginning. So any details on that one? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, I've talked with some um, industry, some law firms, I'm in the law school, about what can be done. And we haven't come up with, I mean, I'll be honest, we haven't come up with a good formula, for example, for online, you know, internships, particularly for students that I might normally uh, have go to, for example, the U.S. where I have lots of contacts in the legal field. I've had them go out to the U.S. in the past. And right now, as many of you may be aware, there are lots of problems with COVID-19 in the U.S. So my students don't really want to go there. <laughs> um, and that's the reality, but we can't find out a good way to have uh, uh, some other type of alternative internship. I have heard of and read of some accounts of, you know, online internships that have worked a little bit. And I'm hopeful that we can come up with a way of having uh, some internships that can work, particularly in the legal field, because a lot of uh, the legal work is actually research related and writing related. And I think a lot of that could actually be done online. I just need to convince some people in industry that that, that can actually be done. So we're having those conversations. True. Um, I have another one here. Um, teaching is in many ways a performance meant to engage the audience, the students, and like actors, some perform better on stage and others are better in movies. 
with the chance to retake a scene. So what have you learned about your own teaching through being forced to switch online? Well, um, first of all, I think I enjoy the stage a lot more than the online teaching. Uh, I like the interaction with the students. Oh, that's what I tell my students is the thing that I like about being a professor the most. But I have found that by being online, I've come up with different ways of interacting with the students. And uh, I found, particularly with my law school courses past semester, that I needed to engage with them one on one. So it took a lot of extra time, but I met with them outside of the class, you know, using one on one uh, video meetings, telephone calls and other things, but making sure that I connected with them and could really understand a little more about who they are, what they're doing and those types of things and whether they're succeeding or not. Because I was concerned not just about whether I could succeed in an online format, but whether they were able to actually succeed as well. So I, I took a lot of extra time and that was actually the most rewarding thing I was able to be a part of, I think, were those one-on-ones with my students. Mm. Mm -hmm. Um, one more question related back to this internship. There's a from Michael Collins from TU Dublin. What strategy did you use for students who had to prematurely end their international study exchange or industry internship due to the pandemic? How did they achieve the academic credits offered for these? Do you have any experience with that? I don't actually have experience with the academic credit side of what happened with internships being uh, terminated prematurely. Um, I didn't have any students who ran into that situation just because of kind of the way our school year works here and, you know, just kind of the, the, the programs I'm involved with. So that might be something I would have to talk to other people here uh, in other departments and administration. Yeah. Okay, another question. At what point does the risk outweigh the benefit in regards to going back to the classroom? Could labs and performative music have been conducted in the classroom this spring semester? If the situation doesn't improve going forward, should they ever go back to the classroom? Well, you know, I think about it from a few standpoints. One, obviously legal. Um, you know, this is a concern in many jurisdictions. Could universities be held liable, you know, for, for students getting sick or professors? Um, and so the, I think there are concerns about that and maybe doing some things as far as legal documentation, uh, students, and professors agreeing to assume certain risks. Uh, but beyond the legal standpoint, I think um, we, we're seeing things that look like they're working. Obviously, we need more study uh, on, for example, uh, using uh, the masks and social distancing and things. But I think we've seen some things that, that have been successful, at least here in Korea, as far as um, having people go into the labs and keeping the labs working. Um, fairly successfully without there being any real issues with COVID-19 as long as they're wearing their masks and, and uh, uh, keeping things sterile and, and those types of things. Um, as far as the arts go, you know, I'm, I'm a former trombonist or I guess a trombonist at heart and, uh, uh, you know, I used to play jazz and in the symphonies and those types of things and I've tried imagining over and over how you could actually do that and I can't come up with any any realistic way. I've actually contacted some people I know, you know, in, in those fields. The only thing that they've come up with is, you know, performing outside. And I don't know how you would do that, you know, in the winter <laughs> in a lot of climates, but, um, you know, there are just some difficulties where I don't, I don't know if there's a way we can actually do it um, safely because you can't really wear a face mask. And, you know, for example, I'll go back to my instrument of choice, the trombone. Uh, you, you have stuff flying around in the air, <laughs> droplets that just come out of these instruments. And so there are certain things where I think we might hit limits where we just can't do it. And we have to acknowledge that though and be realistic and have conversations with our faculty and with our students about when we've hit those limits and help them plan for their future and not give them false hope. Okay, I have one more question here. Oh. You clearly enjoy the magic of in-person communication. However, yes. did you experience any magical moments during your online teaching last semester? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think one of the things that I actually did like about my online teaching was I had the perpetual feedback coming up on my screen. 
and I could have questions coming up on the screen. And one of the things that I found is that a lot of students who may not normally be involved in my, in my classes as much as I would like, um, the introverts were able to type out their little questions online. And I use WebEx a lot and we had the, uh, the way that they could ask questions just directly to me rather than to just to the, the whole group. And so even those that were afraid to ask a question that the whole group might see for fear of looking stupid or something, they could ask a question directly of me and I could go ahead and answer it. And uh, uh, seeing some of the responses from those students actually was quite gratifying, knowing that those who might normally not be able to ask questions were able to engage. And that was actually, uh, I think quite a positive development, and I'd like to keep that as part of uh, some of what I do in future classes. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, thank you, Troy. So what an amazing lineup of speakers. Thank you again to Troy, to Adriana, to Paul. So many ideas and insights, so much to think about and so much to work on. Abraham Lincoln once said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. So let's create a new normal that will strengthen our partnerships encourage and inspire our students and build a better global future for us all so thank you for everyone for watching and please stay safe bye bye <laughs>